Sorry about that. A little bit of technical difficulties this morning. Hello! I have brought back my train whistle. Welcome to the Coding Train, a special Saturday morning edition. It's kind of like the old days of Saturday morning cartoons, only it's Saturday morning coding. I'm having a little trouble, like, actually realizing that I'm here and that I'm live streaming. I'm not entirely sure that I am. This building is basically like completely empty. Actually, I don't think it's completely empty, just this floor where I have this particular recording studio is empty and it's just, it's like so quiet, which is a good thing because I can be loud and ridiculous, but I feel this need to be very quiet. Um, so I'm here, I'm really excited about some stuff that I want to do today. Um, I feel like there must be some important announcements and things for me to talk about before I do that though, but I don't know what those are. Can we just take a moment to breathe? Maybe read some random numbers? <coughs> Oh boy, I really need to get progressive lenses, I think. <laughs> I can't see this book anymore, it's the problem. <clears throat> 15,538, 71,169, 41,268, 54,695. All right, this, that helped me. Uh, that helped me get centered mellow and think about what it is I want to say. So first thing that I want to say is that two new experiments will be coming out on the channel soon. One is a edited version of the neuroevolution steering car coding challenge that I did. And what's going to be pretty different about that is that project was built over four hours and I'm working on, uh, with Mathieu's help, a sort of edited version of that where I um, skip large parts of the coding and just sort of highlight the key parts and then um, kind of come in and explain the interstitial stuff. So that's going to be a new thing that if that works well, then that might allow me to do some live streams where I build a very like large complicated project <laughs> over a long period of time uh, and then able to release like a shorter video about it, which is something that I've been wanting to do. So the, the the ability to watch the full build of the project will never go away. It's just that I think it could be useful to the audience for people kind of coming in and entering this world to be able to sort of like see a highlighted version of the project and then if they're interested sort of dive deeper into it. Um, all right, so that's what I want to say. The camera shutting off also reminded me of something really important, which is that this room that I'm in is going to be no more maybe as of next Friday. So I might do my last live stream. <laughs> Not last live stream, no, 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 no. Just last live stream from this physical space next week sometime. I'm not 100% sure. It might be possible that I still have access to this at some point in July, but I'm not sure. The good news is, <laughs> <laughs> Finally, someday soon. Oh, this will, be, this will be really sad. The coding train will have a moment where the camera doesn't shut off anymore because I am setting up a new space, hopefully with new equipment, um, hopefully with some, some they'll, be, they'll, they'll be good and bad to it, but the channel might actually go on hiatus for a little while um, just because of, um, just in order to set up this new space. So I'm sort of figuring that out. Uh, stay tuned, but there might not be very, there'll be very few or if not as limited live streams in July and August and then coming back full force with the start of the school year in September. But hopefully all of this is going to be good for the, the amount of content that I hope and would like to do um, in the future. Now, a lot of you have been asking for a video about how I set up this live streaming studio and how it works and how maybe in, in the hopes of setting up your own or just learning more about it. And I'm pleased to tell you that a week or so ago I recorded a session in here with an, a third camera. So the actual live streaming setup and somebody else holding a camera, uh, screen capturing everything. And I plan to release that as a video, at least to document this space, this coding train studio, which I'll never know. I, let's, let's, let, let me let you in on a little secret. I think I, can, uh, I think I can pull this off of the wall. I realize my mouth is probably coming up right to the camera. Hello! Oh, this, wow, this is really attached to the wall. Right above the camera. Ah, now I just got hooked onto this. Is this. <laughs> this has always been <laughs> hanging behind the camera. This is my high-tech solution to remind me to look at you, the audience, whom I love dearly. 
one, my. There's also like weird stuff all over the place in this room. There's like a guitar pick over here. All right, what's going on? Ah, now, now. Um, thank you, Simon, for reminding me. Simon, who is, you know, so helpful to me. If you don't know Simon, check out Simon's YouTube channel. Simon is one of the most loyal Coding Train viewers. I don't know if Simon is, I mean, Simon has probably missed a live stream here or there when it was like 3 a.m. his time. <laughs> Otherwise, he's always here. Um, all right, let's see. Just taking a peek at the chat. Oh, this is nice to be here on a Saturday. I feel so relaxed. Like, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so topic-wise, um, I'm going to actually start with building a processing Java library because I think for the past year, it's been the thing I said I would do after the coding challenge, and then I just never get to it. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to spend about an hour on that. I mean, I think building a library will take longer than that, but I'm going to see how far I get in about an hour, at least just sort of getting set up and starting that discussion. Then I will take a break and talk to you about the Coding Trains live stream sponsor for today, Brilliant.org. Um, it was actually one of the things I discovered about Brilliant that I really love, that I didn't realize, is they have an app. So I spent a lot of time on the subway looking at my phone, which I really shouldn't do. I should read or just like be one with the New York City. <laughs> but um, uh, I finally had an app and I was like looking through and doing some of the quizzes and stuff on my phone, which I felt was like a pretty good productive use of my time versus the other kind of like nonsense I might end up looking at my phone. So if you're not familiar with Brilliant, um, check out brilliant.org. Uh, you, so you can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash coding train. That lets you know, that lets them know that you found Brilliant from the coding train, which helps me out a little bit, which is nice. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of free content, um, for example, a daily puzzle, and I'm gonna come back later and do the daily puzzle for today. Um, but there's also a premium uh, subscription which unlocks a lot of other courses and content which I will show you some of later also. Um, and the first 200 people to subscribe to that premium content get 20% 20, 20 off. Um, so let's see. Uh, David is asking in the chat, will you have content to upload during the hiatus? So I sort of thought, <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of one of the reasons why I did that big data and APIs course, which I should pull up here and just mention. Um, I, it's mostly complete though. Um, so um, this is a good question. I, th I would like to, but I don't know. I don't, to TBD, TBD what's going to happen July and August. I'm either going to have content or no content or have live streams or no live streams or try something different. We'll see. But um, there are some ideas for some things that I could do at least have some content on the channel. Nobody watches the coding train in the summer anyway. They come back to school and they're like, I need to learn the coding. Uh, Zubair, thank you for your super chat. <laughs> Family friendly channel, I'll accept your, I guess the moderate, the automatic moderation does not shut off your super chat only because it's a super chat, I guess. <laughs> but uh, thank you, nice, uh, nice Avengers. Um, Icon. Does anybody know where I could get st a stained glass? Avengers stained glass? Don't ask me why. <laughs> I don't know if I seriously want that. Uh, looking at the chat. Uh, all right, so what I want to do first um, before I start doing the processing library is show you some of the community contributions. That's another thing on my list that I've got to make a video about how to make a community contribution. There have been some really awesome ones that have come in. So this is the most recent coding challenge. Um, incidentally, the coding challenge I'm going to do today is the gift wrapping algorithm to create a, what's called a convex hull around a set of points. Assuming I get to it, <laughs> TBD. Um, but this is the most recent coding challenge video. If you haven't watched it, uh, you can. <laughs> um, it is a variation on the Google Chrome dinosaur game, and uh, but using coding train characters and also using a new uh, a feature of the ML5 library, which um, is a machine learning model to recognize certain speech commands. And by the way, one thing I wanted to mention is a lot of people commented that. Um, let, me, let me actually go, let's go over to the, let's just, let me just show you what it was and I wanna, I wanna talk about something. So this is it here. Um, wait, I think I have to, do I have to click for a, uh, uh, yeah. Up. <laughs> it did work. So when I say up, it's supposed to jump. So a lot of people commented, oh, this would work better, less latency, be more accurate with the web speech API. 
And that very well may be true. But one thing I want to emphasize about using this particular model and using ML5, which is built on top of TensorFlow.js, is the model is retrieved and run directly here on the client. So your audio is not being sent anywhere. It is staying local to your computer. Um, when you use the web speech API, I'm like, I guess someone should fact check me on this, but I'm almost certain that your audio goes to the cloud and then is turned into text and returned. And this is, uh, you know, I think something that is that I really like about working with TensorFlow.js and being able to run the models directly in the browser is the data, the images, the audio doesn't have to be sent to a server anywhere. And so there's a little bit of um, privacy consideration around that, which is something that is always important to think about with all of this stuff. Um, okay. So mine is terrible, but let's look at the community contributions. And some of them do have sound, which is really fun. So this first one is Unicorn versus This Dots by Melvin Abraham. Oh, how I? Ah. oh shoot. <laughs> I, I did terribly. Oh, wait, I'm like standing in front of this. I'm give myself a little less space here. <laughs> shoot, I'm terrible at this. All right, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a successful one. Woohoo! Oh, I'm getting better at it. All right, I think I got too good. Remember, a coding train is now a gaming channel. All right, I'm gonna let, I love the sound effects. I love all the additions. The jumping feels much more um, fluid and intuitive. Um, the fonts being used are the coding train fonts. This is really great and fun to see. I love the train whistle at the beginning. It's pretty great. All right, thank you, Melvin, for that. It's really awesome. All right, let's go to this dot jumper by Swift Potato. Awesome name, Swift Potato. Are you a as always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. Oh. <laughs> I love this. All right, guess press any key to restart. As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song, this dot, this dot. Why is it, uh, okay, let's try this one more time. As always, I always forget the this stop. This is kind of sad. I don't know what this scroll thing is happening. <laughs> All right, audio is a little loud. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. Uh, I can turn that down. Is Swift Potato in the chat? Anyway, super fun. I love using the uh, I love using the this dot song. Um, excellent, thank you. I love the credit here of everything. Wonderful work. Um, super fun. Okay, let's. Oh, some rough ideas on doing this in three D. So this is pretty interesting. Uh, this is from uh, uh, D D C Brichetti, Dave Brichetti. So this is interesting. Let me just lower. Oh, cool. Look at that. So this this is. Oh, wow. This is super fun. A roller, which is like a little cone. And is this, this is using P5 WebGL, which is really surprising to me. P5 WebGL has really improved and people have really been able to make projects with it. So this is really fun to see. Cool. Thank you for this. Um, awesome work. I, I, I encourage everyone to check these out and check out the code. And there's one more I know, Simon Tiger. And then also just remind you, you can add your own version here. It's a little tricky. If you've never used GitHub before, I might refer you to my Get and get a playlist, um, but um, but we I encourage you to join to try. You can't break anything. You can't do it wrong. We will welcome you in um, to try to, to add your own contribution. So let's take a look at Simon's improved spawning of trains. I love how Simon includes the algorithm here. So we can see in mine it was just a I just picked a random number and then added a new train. But it looks like what Simon is also doing here, if I understand the algorithm correctly, is that there has is, is sort of like making a minimum distance between the trains. So if it picks two in quick succession, it won't be allowed to do that because the timer has not 
gotten it ready to be able to allow the random number to pick the next trait. So that's great. Space makes browsers scroll down, this is Alco's writing, if the default is not prevented by the handler. So that's probably something that has to be written into the code. Um, and you wouldn't notice it if I go back, thank you Simon for that, if I go back to this.jumper, um, as always, right. I always forget the this dot, this dot, this now dot. Now you wouldn't this notice this, this, kind of this because the whole page is, is there, but I usually have it as zoomed always, in a I bit. I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot. And this space, uh. the default behavior of space in the browser is to scroll down to the bottom. Excuse me for a second. So thank you for these wonderful community contributions. I love them. And, um, yeah, so let's move on to the next part of our day. <laughs> oh boy, I'm so excited about this. Okay, so let me close out a bunch of these things. And uh, I want to talk about this. Um, let's give myself a little more space here. And then, um, where's my open simplex noise coding challenge? Let's get this ready. Okay. Okay. Oh boy. Um, so Alka is writing, I don't know if this came through, ah, Swift Potato, a Swift Potato, hello! A Swift Potato is asking, is there any way to remove or override that behavior? And Alka writes here in our Slack channel, uh, window.addEventListener key press, and then the event comes in as the argument, and you say event.preventDefault. So, uh, and, and Alka is writing there in the chat, look up event.preventDefault. Um, and David writes, I'm working on a dinosaur game for processing that also has birds you have to duck under, which is awesome, great. Okay, um, so I think I'm just gonna get started here and I might come back and record some intro-y stuff for this, but let me just try, um, I imagine this might be a multi-part series, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. Uh, uh, Gemichu writes, I am watching you live for the first time. Gemichu, where are you watching from? I always love to hear where people are from. And, uh, you know, just to be, a, just, it's important to be aware, I, I kind of peek at the chat every once in a while, but I don't, I don't catch every message. I do often look at the chat after the fact, and I do read all the comments that people write on the videos, scanning through them. Um, and if you feel so inclined, uh, you can also join as a member or as a patron of the coding train um, because I'm actually gonna do the recording green screen recording session hopefully a little later today or else on Monday for members only to for the interstitial stuff for that neuroevolution challenge. So if you wanna uh, get a link to my members only live streams, you can um, do that. Now again, you, you don't, don't feel you're missing anything. Those are just kind of some raw recording sessions of me in front of a green screen and all of and that eventually comes out uh, but if you want to tune in for that, a little behind the scenes, uh, that's what, um, I do that with a smaller audience. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, okay. I'm nervous. I don't want to start. I'm going to start. This one's, this one's for all you processing Java people from the old days. Let me just check... Uh, Twitter and make sure nobody's telling me not to do this. <laughs> uh, okay, no, I think I'm good. Whew. All right, let's, uh, let's see if I've got a whiteboard going. I do not. Hello, whiteboard, yep. Okay, that's good. Do I have a marker is the question. Ah, welcome new member. Matias Azevedo Oliveira, thank you. You have made the lights blink 
at my apartment in Brooklyn. I'm not there right now, but the lights are blinking. <laughs> Train whistle for you. By the way, I have this idea. So I, I know I shouldn't get off on these random tangents, but I just do. Um, I have been really struggling to keep up with the uh, rewards that people get for signing up as a YouTube member or a patron, which are stickers or books. Um, so I'm really, really trying hard to get some new systems in place and have all that cleaned up over the summer. If you're someone waiting for something, I sincerely apologize and you should continue, continuously bug me about it. You shouldn't apologize for it, you should just bug me about it. Um, but I have this idea of creating, uh, this came up at the IO conference, uh, of creating a coding train branded like laser etched uh, train whistle. Because that's a thing people want, right? <laughs> so if I could like order these in bulk and then I could laser, laser etch them with the coding train logo or something and then those could be a thing that I mail to people and that I think will be easier to do. I suppose I could sign them also. I don't know if anyone cares about that. But um, the books are just like hard to mail, crazy expensive. Um, it just doesn't, if I have to, it's, it's not working out very well. But if you signed up and you were promised one, you must get one. Otherwise, my whole world of the sense of the way the universe works will not be aligned. It will bother me. I will lose so many nights of sleep. So please um, keep me posted. All right. Ah, just putting down this. Uh, if we have some time later, solve the cube. Um, you'll see my progress. Still just basically doing beginner's method, um, but I, I can do the cross without having to put it on the yellow side first. I mean, that's not that hard. <laughs> Yay for me. All right. We've got a whiteboard. We've got this. I am going to start. So um, let's, see, let's see how far I get in approximately a half an hour or 45 minutes, and then I want to take a break and look at the brilliant uh, daily puzzle. And then either do more of the library stuff or move on to some comp talking about computational geometry. I would have a sip of this unbranded coffee cup from a not a sponsor. Water has really let me down, by the way, these days. I have no water. Come on back to me. Come on back to me with that great water H2O sponsorship. And let's get the Slack channel up here. Um, all right. <clears throat> all right. Hello and welcome to a new series about building a processing library in Java. So if you've ever wanted to learn a little more about Java programming and how open source works and how you can contribute your own code, through to, as a library to some other platform, this is the place for you. And I have to admit, like, I really, I don't know how you, I forgot what I was gonna say. I have this like really nervous tick. I wonder if this is like some kind of genetic condition where when I start teaching or live streaming, inevitably my nose becomes very itchy. <laughs> and then like, I feel like I need to scratch it or blow my nose. It's like, when it, it's like a, a nerves thing. All right. <clears throat> I started working with processing in 2003, which is some number of years ago. It's too many years ago, I can't possibly do that math. Um, and one of the things that I first did when working with processing was contribute libraries to it. And you can see here I'm scrolling through the processing libraries page. There are libraries for all sorts of categories. I'm just going to go under video for a second. Oh no, well, that's the actual video library, sorry. There are libraries for, there are libraries for all sorts of categories. I'm just going to go here under uh, video and vision, for example. And we'll see there's a library for using like the PSI camera, for doing uh, OpenCV. Oh, look at this one for the Kinect. And it's really not kept up to date. Um, there's a lot of wonderful libraries here. Blob detection, this is a really useful one. I have some videos about doing blob detection processing with your own code, but you could use a library for it. So maybe you've used processing, maybe you've used a library before. How would you make your own library? This is what this video is about. Or this is what this video series is about. All right, so let's see. What am I going to say next? Um, I 
I have to admit something to you. I have not actually done any research or practice before I'm beginning this right now. I have made processing libraries, but I haven't really made one in a while. So a lot of this series will also be me sort of figuring it out as I go, and hopefully everything works just fine. Um, it's somewhat of an ancient medieval art <laughs> how to build a Java, a co compilation of Java classes to insert as a processing library. Um, and I'm, a lot of the stuff I, you notice I've been doing is JavaScript. Um, on the channel these days, but um, maybe after I do this, I'll come back and show you how to make your own JavaScript library as well. Uh, uh, Matthias is asking who edits the videos, and that is uh, Mathieu, who is a video editor um, and, and more uh, based in Montreal, Canada. Um, okay. Um, all right. So the very first thing that we need to do is go to the processing library template under the processing GitHub organization. And you'll notice something. It actually says template here, and there's this little button here, use this template. This is a new feature of GitHub. I don't know how new it is. Maybe it's been there for a while, but I've actually never used this feature up until right now. Mostly when you're using a GitHub repo, you're cloning it which means you're, um, let's see, is that what I want to say? Stop beeping at me, this extra computer here. Mostly when you're using, <coughs> this should probably be like, I don't know, I'm so confused these days because I now I do the offline recording with the, uh, whatever. I'm just going to keep going. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, now, mostly when you're, a lot of times when you're using GitHub, maybe you're just trying to find some code and you're clicking around, you copy and paste it, or maybe you're even ambitious enough to clone or download. So cloning is a process of taking this repository and cloning it, say, to another, to your local computer, your laptop. I'm actually going to do that a little bit later in this video. Um, downloading would just be downloading the code. There's this process of forking a repo, which is kind of creating a version of it that is linked back to the original version. But this is a scenario. This is the, a rare scenario where what I want to do is build an entirely new project. It's not really related to this. It's related to this in that this is my starting point, but there's no reason for what I want to build to be a fork of the template because I am not contributing back to the template. If there is an issue with something wrong in the template, then I would want to make a fork <laughs> to fix the thing that's in the template, but I just want to start from it. That was a very long explanation for me just basically pressing this button. So I'm going to press this button. I'm actually going to switch this to coding train um, because I would like this library that I make to be a community project that people could submit to. And I mean, I could do that under Shiftman as well, but this is a coding train processing library. And we're going to call this open simplex noise uh, library. Uh, I'll call it for processing. Let's call it for processing. So that's going to be the name of the repository. This is a new, a processing or open simplex noise. And I want to make it public. And I want to create the repository from the template. So. I love this. I love that this is a new repository, a new project, but GitHub is being thoughtful about this and crediting back where it was generated from. Now, what is the next step? The next step is now I want to work with this and update the code and change it around and put my stuff, my open simplex noise stuff in it. And by the way, you might be wondering, what is open simplex noise? So I have a whole video about what that is. Um, it's not really important right now. The point is how to make the library, but I want to make it in the context of something that would be useful. So I'll come back and talk more about open simplex noise and we'll look at some examples with it as we get a little further along.
<laughs> All right. So I'm going to click clone. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to open up. Hold on. Let me, let me, uh, Let me be more fixed up about this, right? All right, I'm going to click clone. I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to go to my console uh, application, which I'm using iTerm, and I'm going to say git clone and paste that in. So this is now going to, and this should be bigger. Let's try this one more time. <laughs> so I'm going to click clone. Uh, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go to my uh, terminal application. I'm just on the desktop and I'm going to say git clone and I'm going to clone this particular repo which will now download everything to my computer. I'm just going to then open up that repo. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not. I was about to open up that repo and I'm doing it right now in Visual Studio Code which would be fine because then I could kind of like look at like what's in there. There's like a hello library Java template and stuff. But no, no, no. Close all this. This is not what I want. This is a very momentous occasion. This might be the first time I need to use a Java development environment. I'm sure there's some magical way I could make Visual Studio Code do what it is I want to do. But I want to do this with a Java development environment, namely Eclipse. Yeah, Alka, this is pretty new. I just turned it on because I have admin privilege. Alka is saying they've never seen the template repo before. And I just turned it on in, because I have admin privileges of the processing organization. And I hope it was okay that I did that. Um, all right. Now, I don't even know if, if I've downloaded Eclipse. I didn't CD into the repo, I know. Oh, shoot. Everything's going wrong now. Camera's shutting off. IntelliJ, right. Nobody, nobody wants me to use Intig. I don't know. I've never used IntelliJ before in my life, so I feel like I have to use Eclipse. Eclipse.org, um, Intelli IntelliJ. I'll pull that up. This is the Eclipse Foundation website where you can download and install Eclipse. And I'm going to do that in a moment. I should mention also that uh, a lot of people in the chat are saying, oh, use IntelliJ. I like that better than Eclipse. I don't know. Maybe it is better. Maybe it's worse. Who knows? Who cares? I'm just going to use Eclipse. It's the only one I've ever used. And I want to have at least one thing here that I don't have to learn that's new. But maybe I can come back and show IntelliJ at some point, Or one of you can make your own video about doing the same thing with IntelliJ and I can link to it. All right, so let's download Eclipse. So I'm going let's to, down, let's download Eclipse. I'm going to get this most latest version. Uh, I'm going to download the 64-bit. Uh, this link looks good. Um, Eclipse, much like processing, is a non-for-profit foundation, um, and you can donate. Actually, I don't know if they're non-profit. I assume they are. I should try it once to form your opinion on it. Yes, I definitely should. Whoops, what's going on here? Uh, all right, Eclipse installer. Oops, hold on, hold on. Ah, I guess I'm doing it. All right, once you've downloaded it, you're going to get this Eclipse installer, and then you've got to choose what you want here. Um, I want Eclipse IDE for Java developers, I think. That's what I'm doing. 
So I'm going to install it here. Uh, hit accept. And here we go. That was fast. Uh, accept. Well, let me... Oops. IntelliJ ID community is free and open source. That's good to know. All right, I've downloaded, installed it. I'm going to launch it now. I also should mention that I think the processing library template is designed for use with Eclipse. It's creating a workspace, which is similar to like a processing sketchbook. Um, welcome is great, and I'm just going to do this. Open it up. All right. All right, let's see. All right. All right, here we go. I have Eclipse now. Now, I'm going to have to do some work to like fix the font sizes. I realize if you're watching this, you can barely see anything. But right now, I'll just use Zoom for a second. And what I want, these are my options. I could create a new project, a Java project, a sort of general project. But what I want to do, I, I'm pretty sure, is import a project. So I'm going to click on Import. And then uh, these are all of my options. Oh, look at this. It even has like a Git. So I actually could probably import import it from Git, but I think I can just do general existing. I think I, this is what I want. I think I want existing project into workspace because the processing library template is an existing Eclipse project. <laughs> so then I'm going to hit next and I want to find that directory, which is just on my desktop called open simplex, uh, open simplex noise for processing. I'm going to hit open. And you can see, look at that. Oh, interesting. It's called Processing Library Template. So there's probably somewhere that there's like a name for it that I might want to rename. I'm not going to worry about that too much right now. I'm just going to click now Finish. Uh, finish. And OK, there we go. This is looking promising. Oh, I have a red X. But you can see now this is an Eclipse project. It's got all of the files here in this like directory tree. Um, there's a data folder, an examples folder, a lib folder, a resources folder. I may have to get into what's in those things. But the most important one right now is the source folder. I'm going to click on that and we're going to see like this is really, this is the Java file. It's not a PDE file, not a processing development environment file. It's an actual proper Java file. This is what the file that I'm going to need to work with. Um, is there a dark mode for Eclipse? All right, hold on. People are telling me there's a dark mode. Let's look for that. Appearance. No. I'm looking, the chat has not told me where it is yet and I haven't found it. All right, let's Google, I guess. Oh, that's from 2014, that's not gonna help me. Preferences, general appearance, okay. Ah, theme. What's that about? Oh, okay. 
Great. Let me quickly mention that under the preferences, under general appearance, you can change the theme to dark mode, which I'm doing right now. Um, and then let me get the font size. Where would the font size be? Um, I think it'll be under appearance, colors and fonts. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh my God, this is like insane. Oh. Seriously? Okay. That actually change it? That didn't seem to do anything. This text song is used by text editors. Let's see. Okay, that's good. So at least I got the font bigger for the text editor. Java editor text font under Java. Click Java editor. Okay. I think I've got that. I think I'll leave the rest of the fonts. Um, small. Okay. I've also gone, this won't, this is not something necessarily you'll need to do, but I've also gone and increased the font size for the code editor just so we can see it bigger. So where I am right now is I have got, I'm looking at hello library.java. I'm looking at this code and I'm in the Eclipse editor. So the next thing that I want to do here is I want to figure out why do I have these errors? Oh, I know why, I know why. All right, interesting, interesting. Oh, this is exciting. This is very exciting. Um, all right. These are the errors. P applet cannot be resolved to a type. The import processing cannot be resolved. Why do I have these errors? Well, the, the idea that this project where I'm building a processing library depends on the processing core library itself. And I don't have that anywhere on my computer. Yes, I have the processing application, so maybe there's some way for me to link this to the processing application, but I'm gonna do you one better. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to clone the entire processing core library source code, and I'm going to have that as a project in Eclipse, and I'm gonna have this project refer to that. So let's look at how I would do that. Pretty sure. By the way, there's probably um, some instructions for how to do this. <laughs> Let's look for that for a second. Uh, oh, rename your Eclipse project, okay. Oh yeah. Oh, I see. So I could just get core.jar. I think I'd rather have the full. <laughs> uh, all right. I think. So this, oh by the way, so this we can now change. 
But so by the way, anyone who wants to submit a pull request to Processing Library to change these instructions, because you no longer need to do fork, you can you use as a template, which makes so much more sense, um, that can be fixed. But let's not, I'm not gonna worry about that right now. I'm just gonna mention, all right. Before I do this next step, I should point out that even though I'm kind of haphazardly, <laughs> no, no, wait, hold on, haphazardly is not the right word. Before I go on to the next step, I should point out that, wait a minute. Before I go into the next step, I should point out that even though I'm like awkwardly trying to figure this out as I go, there is a guide to how to do this that's part of the Processing Library template README. And the step that I'm on right now actually is this. Add core.jar or and other jar files to your class path. So one way that you could do this is just to get core.jar. What is core.jar? It is the entire processing core library packaged into a single file. A jar file is like a zip file of all of these uh, Java files all packaged into one. But I'm gonna do this in a slightly different way, which I think uh, is interesting. I don't know if it's better or worse, which is to, instead of adding core.jar to the class path, I'm gonna add the processing source code project to the class path. That way, if I need to, I can actually poke around that as well. So to do that, I'm going to go to, nice little edit point here. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the processing, uh, main processing repo itself. I'm gonna grab this clone. I'm gonna copy that. Um, I should point out that you, oh, I should also mention, I should also mention that I am using SSH, meaning I've already gone through some instructions for how to set up an SSH, ASS, <laughs> meaning I've already gone through some instructions of how to set up an SSH key on my computer to authenticate to GitHub automatically. Um, you can do this more simply by just using HTTPS. I should really make a video on how to do that. Somebody remind me someday, but that's why this is working for me so automatically. Okay, so I'm gonna grab this. I'm gonna go back, oops, sorry, cancel. I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back to my terminal, and I'm going to say git clone uh, the whole the full processing library. This is going to take a little while. Can't do that, Orange Julius. I like to call it Orange Julius. <laughs> I hurt myself there. Wow, this is really taking a long time. clone that repo, I can go back to Eclipse. I'm going to say file import uh, existing projects into workspace. You can see that's what I'm doing again. Uh, next, uh, browse uh, back to the desktop, processing, open, and ah, okay. So do I really need all of these? Great. <laughs> I have no idea. So these are all of the processing projects that are part of the core processing repo. Let's try for right now just processing core. I'm pretty sure that's the only one that I need as a dependency to build my processing library. So I'm gonna uncheck all the others. I'm gonna hit finish. 
It's there. So now we can see I have processing core with an X also. <laughs> All right, let's see. So before it's going to work as a dependency for processing library template, this can't have any errors in it. So let's see what happens here. So there's an issue with, I should have just gotten core.jar. The issue is with the Java FX renderer. Hmm. Hmm. That, you can see how that's the entire error. Uh, ooh, what's think different.java? There's so many little like uh, Easter eggs inside the processing source code. Processing Java FX. So Java FX is missing. Is this because of the version of Java that I'm using? Uh, Nathan is asking, why is the processing repo more than a gig? I will uh, get back to you on that. I should probably just go back to the core.jar thing. It would make it so easy. <laughs> I should really just bring in core.jar. It will I'd be done in two seconds. I should probably follow the instructions. But I do want to fix this. Um, uh, Java FX. Why don't I have Java FX? Do I have to like install that separately? Oh, install new software. Okay, that's not so bad. Right, let's try that. Is not anymore included. I am using Java 8, I'm pretty sure. Um, I need to use the correct version of Java with processing, but I, I think that I am. Set up path. All right, let's try this. I think, I think that I found the issue here, which is that Java FX, which is something that processing uses, is not by default included in the version of Java that I'm running with Eclipse. And so uh, what I need to go now is do help, install new software. Uh, I assume that I could just search Java FX. No, that's location. <laughs> All right, let me find that. Uh, Oh, where? Install new software. Enter EFX Eclipse. Where do I add it? Did I not get help? Install new software. Yeah, that's where I am. Work with, oh, there's a drop down. Oh, there's a drop down. EFX Eclipse is in the marketplace. VFX Eclipse is in the marketplace. This is so, it's like the tiniest font ever. I can barely read it. Select a site. So there's like a marketplace? Eclipse Marketplace, okay. There we go. Okay, that's good. All right, let's try this. 
So I can actually just go to Eclipse Marketplace um, in under Find. I can type FX, and this is what I want: EFX Eclipse. Um, and let's uh, let's try installing that. How do I how do I tell whether it was installed or not? <laughs> what version of processing am I using? I mean of Java. Java 12. I don't know what that is. SE. Oh, yes. Oh, it installed. Okay. All right, restart now. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, that's bad. <laughs> it's having me, re I, when it finishes installing, it'll ask you to restart Eclipse, which is what I'm doing. And I can see that everything is totally working now. <laughs> Install? <laughs> I think I might have to go back to the core.jar. No updates found. I might have to go back to my core.jar. Um, Java FX is not provided in Java 12. Wait, I should be using Java 8 for processing. Does it say on the processing library template? Oh, oh, I just need to add this. I need to explicitly add it. Let me just see if that fixes it. <laughs> it didn't fix it. Java SE 1.8, that's what I want. Don't I need like a JDK or something? Hold on, let's see. following this. Maybe I need to make sure I have the JDK downloaded. F5 would refresh. Everyone's telling me I should be using IntelliJ. No, I'm going to use Eclipse. I used Eclipse 15 years ago, and it's what I'm going to use now. <laughs> Let's see. Sometimes it gives me a little. F5. I don't have the functions anymore. That's a ridiculous Mac. Okay, I should just go import core.jar. We'd be done with this nonsense. Hold on, let's go to uh, this 
Is this what I want? Do I want this? Do I need this? Java and that's there. Doesn't matter. Projects, libraries. Oh, I'm going to have to move on from this soon. Let me do this. Hold on. All right, I'm going back to core.jar. I got rid of the errors in like two seconds. <laughs> All right, this was like a cool idea so that I could look in the processing source code, but it's so not necessary. So let's just not do this. I'll come back to this another time. All right, I'm just going to do the core.jar. <laughs> Net beans. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just do the core.jar solution. So I'm going to go back to where I was here. <laughs> this will get edited back. I, I was trying to be ambitious, and I'll look into that later. So Nathan is suggesting that we redo the processing template to use IntelliJ. I think actually a contribution of a version of the template for IntelliJ would be great. And that would probably be something that would be accepted or at least could be pointed to. Um, so if you're interested, I would say rather than replace it, although I, I could imagine maybe in the long term sense, maybe it makes sense. But for, for as a first step would be to just create a duplicate version of it. All right. We're going to use Maven or Gradle. I know. Look, <laughs> I can only do what I can do. All right. The it, P applet cannot be, oh, new member. <laughs> Hello, Michael Kreschke, which I'm sure I pronounced that completely incorrectly, but I sort of tried to do it with some kind of vague accent to make it seem like I knew what I was doing, but clearly I did not. All right. <clears throat> Errors. Um, yeah, everyone's, I gotta wait till people stop telling me about the camera. Errors, p applet cannot be resolved to a type, the import processing cannot be resolved to a type. So this is because this particular project needs as a dependency the processing core library itself. So there are a couple different ways that I could tell this project, my processing library, about the processing core library, and I'm gonna show you the easiest way to do that right now. I should mention, however, that all of this, whoops. I should mention, however, that all of this, all of what I'm awkwardly kind of stumbling through is actually here as instructions on the readme. And the step that I'm looking to do right now is adding core.jar or other jar files to your class path. So the idea of a class path is a very important concept in Java programming. It is the path where all of your dependencies live, all of the classes that your project depends on live, the path to your classes, the class path. So the way that, the, what I want to find is core.jar. That's a bundled jar file. It's like a zip file that has all of the processing Java classes in it. And there's a variety of different ways that I can find it. But if I happen to have processing installed on my computer, on the Mac, and you can find this similarly on Windows or Linux, um, I can actually just right click on here and go to show package contents because, whoops. 
right click on here and go to show package contents. A, a Java application is actually just a directory of files. It, it's kind of the operating system is hiding that for you. But I can go here under Java and look at this core.jar. Now I might find that I need other dependencies eventually, but right now I, I just want core.jar. So what I'm going to do is I am going to copy that into my project just by dragging it over. I'm just going to put it in the root directory. Maybe there's a better place to put it. Oh, I could link to the file. Huh. Maybe I should just link to the file. Uh, copy link. What should I do, people? Welcome new member, Ramnel Sanchez. <laughs> Thank you. Someday I'm going to have some fancy stuff with buttons and little things will go off. Um, I said Ramnel. It's Rommel. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I'm going to copy it. Should I copy it or link it? Uh, excuse me. Oh, that was a burp. <laughs> that was very embarrassing. <laughs> copy. All right. There might be different reasons why you might want to do one or the other. I'm, I'm going to stick with copy just so that I know it comes in. So I can see core.jar is there. I still have my errors though. But what I want to do now is I'm going to right click core.jar and I'm going to go to build path. Build path is essentially another sort of term for class path and I want to add this to the build path. So I'm going to click add to the build path and then voila, all of those errors go away. It knows what p applet is because p applet is part of processing.core. p applet is the base class for every sketch you write in processing. Yes. Uh. <laughs> I like, by the way, how the first person to answer in the chat who just said copy, I took as his word. It's like, that's, that's crucial. That's the, key. That's the answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just tuned in. D Space F just tuned in. Why the heck are we in Eclipse? I don't know. It's a really bad idea. But I, I'm so happy to be in Eclipse. I used to use Eclipse all the time, probably not in 10 years. But there's some sort of like warmth that's filling my heart about this right now. I just love it. Okay. <clears throat> Almost finished this first part now. I'm just about ready to actually start doing the coding of the library itself. This first part was really just to set up the project itself. But I want to do a few more cleanup things. Number one is it shouldn't be called processing library template. So I'm going to right click here and go to refactor, rename. And I'm going to change the new name to open simplex noise for processing. What else? Let's see. Let's see what else it says here. Okay, add external jars. Oh, I should have put it in libs. Okay. Oh, I think I got another new member. Did I get another new member or did I already thank this member? Yeah, Romal, I think. Thanks. Okay. Um, we're just done with, about done with this first step. Okay. Looking more closely at the instructions, I've discovered actually that the point of this lib folder is this is where other dependencies should go. So I'm actually just going to move this core.jar file into there. And I think the project, oh, now it's complaining at me. So you should have copied it in there in the first place. But now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the project, go to build path, 
uh, configure build path. And this is now, it's confused. This, this core.jar file is now missing. So I'm going to hit uh, edit. No, no, no. And no, I'm not going to hit edit. I'm going to hit remove. <laughs> and then I'm going to do uh, apply and close. Then I'm going to just go back to this and go to build path and add back to the build path. Okay. So now I have my project set up. Hmm. There's, now I have my project set up. There are a few last remaining steps we need. We want to get to the point where I can build the library. I want to see the build successful message and I'll be done with this first video in the series. So what I need to actually do is I need to look for a file called build.properties. And this is going to be in the resources folder of the Java project. So let's go back to Eclipse, go here under resources, build.properties, that's what I want there. Oh, I have never seen anything like this. What? I'm so confused. So this to me in my head has always just been a text file. Does anybody know how I can change the font size of all of this stuff? What's it telling me to change? One through four. Well, what are the items one through four now? How do I even do this? No idea. I've never seen this before. So this is like a GUI for the build.properties. But where's all the stuff? Panel build. Ah, there we go. All right, thank you. <laughs> so it appears that uh, Eclipse has added a GUI for build.properties, but I'm actually just going to click here <laughs> so I can look at the actual text file. Um, and this is, uh, this is, this is important. So where is my processing sketchbook? I'm going to open up processing to make sure this is right. I'm going to go to Processing's Preferences, and we can see Users, Coding, Train, Documents, Processing. That's where the sketchbook is. Great. That's User, Home, Documents, Processing. Okay. Ah, class Path, Local, Location, Applications, Processing, App. Now, again, um, you're going to have a different location. Oh, I can also do this. Oh, I should just... I see. I can link to this project. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I'm trying to think. <clears throat> This is the next setting that I need to make sure is correct. So this needs to point to that core.jar file, the processing, uh, the processing core library itself. So I could get to it, um, you know, on Windows, it's sort of like showing me how I might find it. I could get to it from this Eclipse project, the path to this Eclipse project, and the libs directory, which I think makes would make sense. Like documents. Eclipse Workspace, is that a thing? Hmm. Where's the Eclipse Workspace? Oh no, but it's, it's actually, this project is, oh, it's here. Okay, it's there. Okay.
users. There, okay. Oops. This is the next item that I need to make sure points to the right location. I want to find this core.jar file, the processing core library. So I could actually point to where the processing application is actually saved on my computer if I had it in the applications directory, which I might actually happen to have it here on my desktop. So this would have to change. Or I can actually give it a direct location. In this case, I can actually just tell it, um, I'm going to tell it user home on the desktop is this particular project. Whoops. Um, so let's go, sorry, let's go here. I'm going to say PWD. Whoops. PWD. So this is actually where it is. I'm going to grab this directory. And then in that directory under LIBS for libraries, that, or no, it's just LIB, sorry. LIB for lib, library, that is, oh, let me do that again. I don't know why I'm obsessing over this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. This is the next setting that I need to change, and I need to make sure it points to the processing core libraries. I spent a lot of effort getting that core.jar file into my project, so I now I also need to point from build.properties. So there's a variety of places I could point to the processing application, which for me is on the desktop, but it might be in your applications folder. It's gonna be different on Windows or Linux. I think for me what might actually be easiest is just to comment this out and point to where the actual this actual project is. So this actual project is here on my desktop, Desktop open simplex for noise processing. So um, I can put that in here, paste that here. Then there's a file called lib for library where core.jar is, uh, not a file, a directory. So I should just put that in here and hit save. That's good. Class path local include core.jar. And then class path libraries location is sketchbook.location library. So all this is the same. Target version 1.8, that should be fine. Um, all this stuff is fine. Uh, project name, uh, so there's more stuff I should change. So I'm just gonna say open simplex noise. Um, I'm gonna say uh, open simplex noise for processing. Um, this is not super important. I can fix this. I can fix this stuff up later. But let's um, just do some of this right now. Uh, and I don't have a light. Uh, a URL yet, and there's categories. Let's just put it in other. Um, actually, is there math? Math? I'm doing all these now. All right, I'm, I'm going to fix this up later. I'm going to put the rest of these, but you can see that there's lots of other things there's, that I can uh, put in here. But I'm going to leave this all out. I'm going to hit save, and I'm going to go to the next step. All right. The next step is to compile the library using ant. What is ant? <laughs> ant is from Apache. Ant or Apache Ant is basically a build system for Java. Uh, it's maybe somewhat ancient, <laughs> uh, but it's what's used by the uh, processing library template. So if I go back to Eclipse, and somewhere up here, there should be like a little Ant icon. There it is. I think that's Ant, right? This up here is the Ant. And no, that's debug. That's debug mode. That's not the Ant. Oh, maybe I go to build.xml. I think I go to build.xml. Uh, <laughs> Let's look at the instructions. <laughs> Window show view ant. Ah. So to be able to see ant, I need to go to window show view ant. You can see the little icon of the ant. Let's click that. And now I should have somewhere. Where's my ant? Ant Apache, where are you? Oh, ant. Now I see it. 
HTML CSS. Drag the resources build.xml file there. Okay. The next step is to take this build.xml file and drag it over to here. And we can see there it is. Processing library, open simplex noise for processing. And I can click this and do run as ant build. Run as ant build. Okay, now we say a little prayer to the ant god. <laughs> and we <laughs> run that. <laughs> we built the processing library. Build successful. Look at this. I'm going to open up processing. I'm going to go to sketch, import library. Uh, oh, wait, I, think to, I need to restart processing. I'm going to launch processing. I'm going to go to sketch, import library. Oh, look at this. Open simplex noise for processing. The library is there. Now, it's saying import template.library, and there's no code for me to actually use, but I now have the processing library building, and I can start writing the code. So in a way, this was really the hardest part. The next stuff that I want to do is going to be quite simple by comparison. It's really just adding the code, adding the examples, building the library, and publishing it. So that will come uh, in the next video or two or three, um, and I'll see you there. Thanks for watching this. We built a processing Java library. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Um, that took a little bit longer than I had hoped. I am now at the halfway point of today's live stream. Um, this is the part where I talk to you about Brilliant, the sponsor of the Coding Train live streams, and do a daily puzzle from Brilliant. Okay, so what is Brilliant? So first, let me go to the web. Uh, I'm going to close all these links, um, and I am going to go to brilliant.org. So this is Brilliant. I mentioned earlier to when I started that Brilliant also has an app that I've started using. Um, I'm a little bit afraid to plug my phone in <laughs> and show you the app because I don't know what sort of strange notifications or text messages I'll get, but I'll figure out a way to do that. I know I can turn on Do Not Disturb and all that. So maybe next time for the next live stream, I'll try to show you the app itself. But I, I've been using it a lot on the, on the uh, subway when I have extra time instead of the other nonsense that I get involved with on my phone. Um, so I think I want to try the, I'm just going to try whatever the first daily challenge is, but I want to show you a few things about Brilliant that's pretty exciting. So one thing is Simon, Simon, loyal coding train viewer Simon Tiger, sent me a message, says, I have a present for you. And I was like, ooh, I'm so excited. And it has to do with this. I don't know how... So as you know, I have a special affinity for polar coordinates, and I have a lot of videos and coding challenge which are all themed around just doing stuff with polar coordinates and things like the cardioid shape, uh, polar flowers, more flowers, polar problem solving. So I haven't actually gone through. I wanted to show this to you without me clicking through it. This is part of the premium uh, brilliant uh, subscription. Um, I'm pre I, um, so th um, but they um, have these extra quizzes and courses themed around different geometry topics, math topics. So for me, what's really wonderful about this stuff now, as I'm kind of running out of ideas for what coding challenges to do, that I can kind of go through these quizzes. It's interactive learning. It kind of keeps me fresh. And then I get ideas um, to build uh, coding challenges. And in fact, one of the reasons why I'm about to do a coding challenge on computational geometry is because of this quiz that I found on Brilliant all about computational geometry. And there's a section here on convex hull. So this is actually what I want to do is uh, in the and a little bit later in today's live stream is look at an algorithm for calculating a convex hull around a collection of points. So I'll talk about more what that is. Um, but I can click on it. You can see there's uh, some, some, some more stuff about that here. Okay, but um, 
You, what's probably most relevant and what I've been looking at are the computer science fundamentals and computer science algorithms courses. So I'm going to be doing these courses over the summer and, um, and uh, thinking of ideas for coding challenges. And if you do that stuff too, please share it with me. So let's do a daily puzzle. Um, these are free. So all you have to do is sign up at brilliant.org slash coding train. There's that URL if you weren't aware. Uh, so let's go to today and let's go to this, which is larger. All right. So what I, what I like to do is I like to recreate the diagrams in P5 um, because why not? Um, I don't know how hard this one will be, but let's, 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 let's read through it a little bit together. Okay. And I'm probably going to need the whiteboard. Is the whiteboard camera on? No. All right, let's look at this. Um, in the figure below, can we relate the areas of the various regions? So there's a light green, dark green, and blue region. The legs of the right triangle are the radii of this larger semicircle, which is the hypotenuse, which while the hypotenuse is the diameter of the smaller semicircle. All right, hold on. I need to recreate this diagram. Oh, I can't see it over there. It's fine. I'm just going to go over here and draw it. <laughs> well, I can see it. Okay. And then I'll come back over here. Uh, so we have R, R, D, uh, one circle, and then another circle. Oh, I didn't do that. I didn't draw that very well. It's not drawn to scale. My drawing is terrible. <laughs> That's my drawing. Oh, God, it's the worst, right? But you get the idea. Okay. So what are we trying to compute? We're trying to compute the area of the smaller semicircle little r, which is what? The area of the smaller semicircle is pi r squared. I don't get it. The larger semicircle r, the diameter of the semicircle d, right? But what is, what's little r? I don't get it. Little r is just half of little d? Must be, right? Um, this makes sense because pi r squared divided by 2. Huh? We have the r and d are the side lengths of the right triangle, so r squared plus r squared equals d squared. Oh, since d equals 2r, we can substitute and simplify as follows. I still don't understand what lower, little, oh, yes, 2r, lo, little r is that. Okay, so which semicircle am I looking for? This one? That would just be, this is the radius for that one. That would just be pi big R squared, right? So, oh, I get it. I think so, right? So if I'm looking for um, this region, this is going to be pi big R squared divided by 2, uh, because, or divided by the whole circle is pi R squared. So actually, that's pi big R squared divided by 4, right? That would be the area of this. I think what we're trying to figure out is what's the area of this, right? And so the area of that is, if, if that's the radius, is, oh, okay, pi little r squared divided by 2. I get that now. And what is little r squared? If we know this, little r squared, r squared plus r squared equals d squared. So d equals the square root of r squared plus r squared which is this, uh, divided by 2, which is uh, the square root of 2r squared divided by 2. That's what r is. And so then I now can say, I can plug this in, right? I can plug this into little r squared. <laughs> Am I doing this right? I'm so, so little r squared, this is, the bottom is going to be 4. The top is going to be 2r squared. I multiply by pi. This is, becomes 2. Pi big R squared divided by 2 is the area of this. Is that right? <laughs> the re I, I, I scanned over this on the subway. I didn't actually try to calculate it because I know the question is, now as we go to the challenge, is how does the, oh, I'm over here. How does the combined area of the four orange, this is called a loon, by the way. So this is a special kind of shape called a loon. It's like a half circle with another part cut out of it. Um, I would really like to draw this because I think it's kind of like a pretty pattern. Um, 
So each side of the square is the diameter of the semicircle. So the question is, how does the combined area of the four orange loons compare to the green area inside the square? Uh, okay. I don't know if people, no one in the chat is yelling at me like I've done something horribly wrong yet. I usually get this stuff wrong, which is the way to learn is to get it wrong <laughs> and then get it right eventually. Or not, or just learn through getting it wrong over and over again, which is kind of my life. All right, so let me draw this diagram. So um, I think I can see it on this computer. I think I can figure this out. So we've got one big blue circle. This is, it's really the same diagram I'm drawing again. This is the blue circle. And then we put a square in there. So this is really, this is, uh, this is the same as what's there. And then we make these four loons, which again, I haven't really drawn to scale. So, okay. So if this is, we're going to call this R, right? So the area of the square, the blue square, would be, uh, oh wait, this is, um, the area of the square is the side length times the side length. So the side length is uh, the square root of, 2r squared, right? We already established that, right? The side length of that square, uh, which is this r squared plus r squared equals d, um, d squared. And then if I take that times that, the side, the area of the square, sorry, is 2r squared. <laughs> 2r squared. That's the area of the square, right? We did that before. Oh, <laughs> you're over here. Okay, now, if the loon's area is this, we have four of them, four, no, where is it? Over here, we have four of them. Well, there's a pie in there. How come we don't have a pie in here? I, four orange sum is pi r squared, I know, that's, Hold on, this camera went out. Right, I did this whole calculation before and I've already forgotten. Oh, wait a second. No, 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 no. Hold on, I have to start over here. <laughs> I have to start over here. Let me start over here for a second. The area of this loon is half of the side length. Oh my God, I've lost my mind here. I forgot which one, which, where is my final answer? Anybody? <laughs> I'm like panicking. This is what happens when you try to do math while you're live streaming and you're really, I don't know what you're doing. Let's start over. I'm going to do this in tandem. All right. We're going to say, I'm just going to do this, uh, that this is our known length, R. So this area here, I, this area here is, oh, I, I see what's going to happen. This area here is pi big R squared divided by 4. Uh, it's the subtracting out that I kind of got confused. Now, this this area here, right, this triangle area, 
right? So this is this this triangle area is two uh, r. No, no, sorry, r squared divided by two. So this little area here is this full area minus r squared divided by 2, which would be 2r squared divided by 4, which is pi r squared minus 2r squared divided by 4. Right? I, the reason why I want to find out this little area is because then once I find out this area, I can then subtract that out. <laughs> I don't think I'm doing this right. Somebody help me. Area of small circle divided by 2 equals area of big circle divided by 4. I need colors. Oh yeah, I should get colors. Let's get some colors. Okay. Whew, this is fun. <laughs> I have felt this. Okay. Purple. So this triangle here is purple. This area here is pink. Oops. And this, I should really use, oh, I should be using the same colors as in this, uh, in the Brilliant Diagram. No one should be applauding me right now. But it's too late. I'm using my own colors. And this area is green. So that area there is, this is what's called the loon. So basically what I want to know is what is the area of one loon? I want to multiply that by 4, and then I want to compare that to the full area of this, this, whole, uh, this whole square, which obviously now is, um, if this is r squared divided by 2, then the whole thing is just 2r squared, because there's four of them. Um, all right, so let me look, let's look back at the explanation for a second. You need to add the two circle areas and then subtract the triangle area. Oh, yeah. Let's, let me go back to here. Because it's giving me a nice little proof here that um, it wants to give me... Oh, right. I forget. I don't have to... To get the area of the loon, I don't need to worry about the triangle. Because, oh, you don't see what I'm doing. To get the area of the loon, oh, this is so silly. I'm so silly. I, I knew I was doing, I knew I did this right the first time. If I just have the area of this, oh, I'm so silly. So hold on, I have my colors. What colors do I need? Pink. I don't actually need to know this area of the pink, um, right? Because what matters to me Oh, no, that's not true, right? Um, the purple segment is a right triangle. Yes, it is a right triangle. The pink segment is called a segment. It's a segment. No, I do need that. Okay, I do. So let me do this again. I can conquer this. <laughs> I can conquer this. 
I'm feeling, feeling good about it. Okay, I'm going to need everybody to help me for a second. First, tell me that this is correct. The area of this purple right triangle is r, whoops, r squared divided by 2, right? This is this area. That's correct, right? Then, so then the area of this quarter circle with a radius of r is pi r, r squared divided by 4. Is that correct? So the radius, then if I want the segment, this, what I want is this whole thing, pi r squared divided by 4 minus the right triangle, r squared divided by 2. So this is really this total area. Do I have this right? Am I right so far? Leonardo is writing, you can find the answer adding the square area and the areas of the semicircles. Oh, you know, I can make this easier. You're right. I don't need to do this in this quarter thing. Okay. I, I could do it as the whole thing, but yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm doing it in a, in a bit of a... Okay. So people are telling me I've gotten this much right. Okay. So now... Let's get the green area. So now what I'm going to do is look at uh, this. This circle, let me get the black pen for a second. This half circle, which has this little r, Right? I'm going to call this half of the hypotenuse of this right triangle little r. We know that little r, the, so, and if the whole thing were d, d equals, d equals the square root of 2r squared. Right? I did that before. That's what that does. So little r then equals that divided by 2. So now this green area, that's the full half circle equals um, pi little r squared divided by 2. So if little r is this, this turns into pi 2r squared divided by 4 divided by 2. So I can actually just cancel out the 2's. I don't like the way that I wrote this. Um, I'm just going to, an easier way to think about this for my brain, which is hurting right now, is just multiply this by 1 half. <laughs> so, uh, so this is 2r squared over 4 divided by times one-half, which, and these cancel out, so pi big R squared divided by four. So that is the area of this whole green thing. So if I take this whole thing, oh, look at this, and then subtract this, we're left with the, this being the loon's area, right? Pi R squared divided by four minus this, this turns into a plus, these cancel out, we just have r squared divided by 2. So the loon's area, according to this calculation, is big R squared divided by 2. And now, for the 
for the grand finale. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> Math is hard. It's very hard for me. Um, <clears throat> we now get to say the loom's area is r squared divided by 2. So four of them, 4r squared divided by 2 is 2r squared. And now, right? The area of this square is also that. Because remember, a quarter of it is r squared divided by 2. Multiply it by 4, 2r squared. The answer is they're equal. They're equal. They're equal. <laughs> they're equal. All right. We're going to now go here, and we're going to say the areas are equal. We're going to hit submit. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, now let me um, find my phone and take a picture of the whiteboard and submit that. Normally, I, 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 I'm, I'm low on, I would love to like um, code this, and then what I thought would be fun was actually like code this and then count the pixels to sort of like prove that it's correct, which is not really a way to prove it. Um, count the pixels of different colors, but um, I don't know where I put my phone to take, oh, this is silly, why well, I don't need to use my phone. I just take a screenshot of this, um, and, um, Somebody screenshot this <laughs> no, Hold on, oh, I know how to do it. You go to here, and go to here. That's correct, which is not really a way to prove it. I'm behind, um, count the pixels of different colors, but um, I don't know where I put my phone to take, oh, this is silly, why I don't need to no, use my don't, phone. Oh, there we go. I just take a screenshot of this. Okay. All right, we're gonna take a screenshot of this. Should I be in it? Oh, I'm not in it. <laughs> I'm just in it over there. Okay, and uh, we will copy this video URL. I'm going to add this image, which should be this screenshot, I'm pretty sure. God, what other, let me make sure that's the right screenshot. Could there be another screenshot? And then let's go to here. What's the... Uh, please add a link to your sketch. Let's do preview. Okay, let's do edit because this should be a link. I wonder if it's a way to like insert a YouTube video. Right, is there a way to, I'm not going to worry about that. Let's go to preview. It's got the link to the video, and I'm going to post it. All right. <laughs> Thank you for uh, <laughs> humoring me <laughs> to watch me struggle through a little math problem. I, you, typically, I like to tie these to a P5JS sketch, but I'm going to leave that as a challenge to you, the viewer, um, to uh, make a P5JS sketch that draws this shape. Maybe you can animate it. Maybe you can, uh, you can add some kind of extra explanation. You can share it with me um, in the comments thread here. If you don't have a Brilliant account, you can sign up at brilliant.org slash coding train. You can actually do that right now because I'm going to take a five minute break. Um, and um, I'm going to come back, and I'm, I think I'm going to try to do, I would, 
I didn't get super far with the processing Java library, but I think I might leave it there for today so that I can do the computational geometry coding challenge. So I have a coding challenge ready to go. Um, and um, so I'm going to come back and do that. Um, so I need a five minute break to actually like get some water, recenter myself, read some random numbers, maybe solve this Rubik's Cube, and then I will be back. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to leave this here and I'm going to throw caution to the wind. I'm going to eliminate myself. Nope. There we go. You don't see me. I'm about to mute my microphone and uh, sign up at the link above and I'll be back in about five minutes. One of these days I'll have a nice, if, by the way, if anyone's an animator out there and wants to help make some animations for like starting soon, technical difficulties, um, get in touch. Get in touch with me on Twitter at Schiffman. I'm, um, that might be someone I'm, something that I'm looking for someone to help uh, make for the coding train. Okay. Um, and I'll be back in about five minutes. Mute the microphone.
As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot, this dot, this dot. This dot song. This dot. This dot. This dot. Never forget this dot. This dot. This dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this. This dot. This dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this dot. This dot. I'm gonna do dot. This dot. This dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this dot. This dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this dot. This dot. I'm gonna do this dot. This dot. This dot. This dot song. This dot. This dot. Never forget this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. I'm gonna do the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, the this dot song. Never forget the this dot. I'm gonna say once again. Here we go. Sing it with me. It's the forward to our team for next song. It's the forward to our team for next song. Auto-tune and the internet will fix that for me. Sing it with me. It's the forward to Cartesian coordinate song. 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 Okay, I'm back in zero minutes, in negative one minutes. <laughs> Let's save this a very important file. <laughs> uh, no, let's just delete this one. All right, thanks everyone. Let's see, did anybody add anything? Oh wait, oh, I lost my, uh, shoot. I think I meant, I meant to do was click on it. Here we go. Oh, come on, people! Still zero helpful, zero interesting, zero brilliant. There should at least be a lot of confused. <laughs> I should probably link to the actual time code where I do it. But, all right, I will check this later. I guess I can't link to, can I link to this comment directly? All right. That, help me out, people. I need some emojis. All right, okay, okay, we're quitting this. Yes, exit. We are going to, back to the browser. Uh, we're going to log in as the coding, to code, whoa, whoa, all right, there we go. Uh, we're going to go here, set this up to 32, I think is what I tend to do. Uh, gift wrapping convex hull. It's going to be the coding challenge for today. You know what I'm going to do? Just give me a second here. I'm going to start with some boilerplate code.
Okay. All right. <clears throat> oh. So thanks again to Brilliant for uh, sponsoring this live stream. I encourage you to check out Brilliant if you have some time. I am now going to move on to the cue the theme music for coding challenges. I don't have one. Ah, someday. I'm going to work on, I'm going to move on to today's coding challenge. So I will return back to that uh, processing library uh, tutorial. I don't think there's actually a tremendous amount more for me to do. Uh, um, but I'll, uh, um, I'll have to return to that next week. I'm glad that I at least got that started. There's a little momentum there, but I don't want to leave today, even though it's now time for me to go because it's already been over two hours. <laughs> but I don't want to leave today without uh, doing a coding challenge. And so I've really gotten recently interested in computational geometry. And the camera went off, I know, I know. You don't have to say in the chat. You don't have to say in the chat. I know it's off, I know it's off. Um, I am going to, oh, and I'm definitely going to need the whiteboard. Um, I'm going to go to here. Um, I'm going to go to Delon. I'm going to search for Delon A. I think this is how you spell it. Must not be how you spell it. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, wow, there's so many. Let's go to this first one. Yeah. Um, so uh, this was suggested, Delaney try. I guess I'll, I'm gonna, maybe I'll just start and I'll explain what I'm gonna do. So hold on a second, everybody. Um, gift wrapping algorithm. Let's go here. Uh, we're gonna need the cross product. Um, Cross product, um, and uh, what's another thing that I'm going to need? Uh, um, oh, Matthias made a full screen to the brilliant challenge. Awesome! I will take a look at that uh, soon. Thank you for that. Um, and then, wait, why am I doing this? Uh, there was another URL that I wanted to pull up, but I'm blanking on. Oh, I know what it is. Silly me. First of all, let's quit processing. Quit this. Um, So this is something, oh, I don't know why it's, that I implemented quite a while ago that I just want to briefly show. Um, it's not the algorithm I'm going to use today, but I will come back to it. Where's this console log? Uh, I don't know why that's in there. Okay, um, I think I am ready. <laughs> Is this the same pattern each time? No, it's different. Okay. I forgot if I had a random seed in there. camera. Oh, I definitely need to erase the whiteboard. Come back to me, whiteboard camera. There we go.
start here. Why does it say Delaunay? All right. All right, everyone. Oh, no, I want to be here. Uh, this would be good to have some kind of like gift that's wrapped, like a prop, but whatever. This is a good like holiday coding challenge, it's gift wrapping algorithm. All right. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to a coding challenge. Okay, that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> Can anyone find for me the date that this was published in 1973? Because I was born in 1973, and maybe Jarvis published the gift wrapping 2D marching algorithm on my birthday. And then that would be like some kind of cosmic alignment of how much I'm gonna fail at doing this. <laughs> All right, I gotta get started with this. I really gotta get out of here by two, so. <clears throat> like this is gonna get done in 40 minutes. <laughs> All right. Especially because I really want to like animate it like this, which is really actually the hard part, but all right. Hello, and welcome to a coding challenge. Today I'm going to tackle the gift wrapping challenge. I'm going to make this code, I'm going to wrap it up as a nice present, and I'm going to hand it over to you, and hopefully you'll make some, something beautiful out of it, or you'll learn something, or all that kind of stuff, that jazz. All right. <laughs> So what is the gift wrapping algorithm? So first of all, the reason why I'm interested in this is this idea of doing an implementation of something called Delaunay triangulation has been suggested and talked about uh, for quite some time. And I'm really interested in tackling this. The truth of the matter is, if I wanted to do a Delaunay triangulation, I would most likely just go and get, get a library that, I, that does it for me. But there is some value in doing it yourself, and I will get to that in a moment when I start looking at the gift wrapping algorithm. We'll come back to that. Now, I, I have looked at this before. This is some code that I wrote a long time ago for an example, um, and this is a demonstration of calculating a convex hull. Hull. This, if I did it correctly, is actually using a different algorithm from gift wrapping called the Gram Scam. It's not a scam. It's not a scam. The Gram scan. Um, and there are a variety of algorithms for computing a convex hull. There's the Chan algorithm and, and more, and they have various different efficiencies. The gift wrapping algorithm is probably the least efficient, but it's a good starter one. So let me talk about what, the, what a convex hull is, and this is not the right pen. Let me talk about what a convex hull is. This is the right pen. <laughs> March 1st, 1973. Nope, it was published before I was born then. Um, missed a point. It missed a point. I don't know what that is. Um, <clears throat> Let me talk about what a convex... <laughs> Let me talk about what a convex hull is first, um, and then look at what the algorithm is, and then we'll go and write the code for it. So the idea is that we're starting with, and this I should say is an algorithm part of the field of research called computational geometry. And I would really like to do a variety of coding challenges around different computational geometry topics. So if you have an idea for one, uh, write it in the comments. So the idea of a, con of a convex hull is first we need just a random collection of points. So if we have a two-dimensional space, and these algorithms typically generalize to higher dimensions, but you know me, I just like to be in two dimensions. It's from my days where I used to be a mime. I didn't used to be a mime. I wish I was a mime. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so let's say we have this random collection of points. So the idea is that I want to connect these points in some way. So we have this idea of convex and concave shit. <laughs> if 
Here's my random collection of points. Now, first I need to make the distinction between convex and concave. So here is a shape that is distinctly concave, a Pac-Man-like creature, so to speak. There is a, uh, a vertex that is interior. Um, how, what is the definition? There is an angle, sorry, that is greater. I guess it would be an angle that's greater than 180 degrees. That's the definition. There is an angle, but out of all of these angles of the shape, there is uh, one, uh, uh, all of these angles that are made out of the vertices of the shape, there is one that is greater than 180 degrees. So a, a convex shape, I always get this confused, but now that I know the term convex hull, I won't forget it again. If I wanted to turn this into a convex shape, I would eliminate this point and connect these two points. And now I have a convex shape. And a convex hull is a polygon that you construct that is convex and contains all of the points. So I can eyeball this and I can say, okay, I'm going to go here, then here, then here, then here. Now, would I go in here? No, I'm going to go down to here, here, here. I'm going to go here. No, nope, I'm going to go here. So this is essentially the gift. I just sort of did my own performance in my, with my brain. <laughs> of the gift wrapping algorithm. I'm eyeballing it. I, don't, you know, I think I got it right, but there's a proper way we can actually calculate it. And the way that you do that, let's get another random sampling of points, is by first starting with an ex a point that we know is exterior to what will be the, that, that's on the convex hull. The way to start with a point that we know that will be on the complex hull, a vertex of the complex hull, is by picking either the leftmost or the rightmost or the topmost or the bottommost. So a convention it'll, is just to pick the leftmost. So I can see this is the leftmost point. Now what I want to do is check this point against every other point. And whichever one is furthest to the left, Right? Whichever one is furthest to the left is the next point. So I, these are going to be in some random order. I'm going to check them in some order. And I'm eventually going to determine that, uh, OK, which vector is most to the left? It's this one. So now I'm going to go here. And now I'm here, and I want to do the same thing. But now I want to pick which one is left of this to this, relative to this point. And that's going to be this one over here. right? We can sort of see, like if I draw a line out to all of the points, if I sort them all, kind of along a radial path, the one that's all the way to the left will be this one. And then I just do that over and over and over again until eventually I get over here and I find that the one furthest to the left is the one that I started with and that's going to be my convex hull. I think that's a good, that's, that's an explanation. It works. All right, so. Here. Coming back over to the computer on the Wikipedia page, we can see a nice animation of this playing out. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons why I like to write the code for these algorithms without a library. So ultimately, if what I'm working on a larger project and I need to compute a convex hull for some reason, having a nice, efficient, maintained, computational geometry library is most certainly the way to go. And maybe I'll try to find some examples of that. There's plenty in JavaScript that I'll link to in this video's description. But most of those libraries will just compute all the points all at once and hand them back to you. And if you want to create some type of interactive explanation of the algorithm, some kind of like animation, whether it's for artistic purposes or educational purposes, you're going to have to write the algorithm itself. And it actually is harder to write the algorithm and animate it. So I'm going to try to do that as part of this coding challenge. Rather than write the algorithm all at once, so that it just like calculates it and shows the end result, I want to be able to see something like this animation playing out. And that'll make this take quite a bit longer. It'll be more to figure out, but I think it'll be more satisfying in the end. Uh, Simon, I am looking, I, right now I'm looking at the YouTube chat. There's a Lee, Lee iOS video on the, I should refer to that, yeah, gift wrapping algorithm.
The appropriate definition for this example is when you go around the shape, you never turn left. <laughs> yes, that's probably a better way of describing it. What's, is there some uh, World Cup game going on? <laughs> is that what's happening? There's some other stuff going on in the chat. Uh, having to define a notion of turning left, right for the purpose of the, oh. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Was my explanation good enough? I think it was good enough. All right. Oh, okay, actually, I'm, the way I'm going to do it is on squared, right? Because I'm going to be checking all the points always. Hmm. How is it only O and H? Uh, the inner loop checks every point in the set S and the outer loop repeats for each point on the hull. Oh, right, it's O and H because you don't need to do every, it's the outer loop is just until you get to the end. Okay, great. No, the way I am going to do it is O and H. Okay, great. It's not O N squared. Okay. Okay. Uh, H times. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. I also should mention that this 2D case uh, is known as the Jarvis March, uh, invented by R.A. Jarvis, and the time complexity is O, N, H, N being the number of points, and H being the number of points around the convex hull. And the reason it's that is because for every point around the convex hull, I have to check all the other points. So that's the number of points around the hull times all of the points. So it's a little bit better than O, N squared, but not by much. And again, there are plenty of other more efficient algorithms for doing it. This is just the one that I'm starting with. All right, let's actually write some code. So I'm, uh, sorry. Let's start writing some code. So I'm starting with a little bit of boilerplate, uh, which is just setting up an empty array, putting 10 random points in the array, and I'm using the P5 vector object, um, which I'll make heavy use of in this, in this uh, uh, let, me, let me do that again. All right, let's write some code. So I'm just starting with some boilerplate code. I'm, I've got an empty array. I'm putting uh, P5 vectors in it. I'm using a P5 vector object to store a point. Um, and then I'm just drawing all the points on the canvas itself. So the first step that I want to do is find, uh, you know, you can see I can run this over and I'm going to get a random collection of 10 points. And eventually I'll do this with a much higher number of points, but let's start with just 10. So the first thing I want to do is find the leftmost point. And an easy way for me to do that would just be to sort the points. So I can actually go here and I could say points dot sort, and the JavaScript sort function takes a callback function, it's not really, which is a, a comparison function which compares two elements. And so I'm going to say a comma b, I'm going to use the arrow syntax. Uh, if you haven't seen the arrow syntax before, I'll refer you to my video on that. I'll say a dot x minus b dot x. So what this is doing is it's returning a positive number anytime a is to the right of b and a negative number anytime a is to the left of b. And that should make it such that um, I can create a global variable. I'll call it left for like the leftmost point. Left equals points index 0. And now if I were to say, you know, stroke 0, uh, 255, 0, and say point p dot x, p dot y, I should see that the left point, oh, uh, sorry, left dot x and left dot y, I should see that the left point is green. So there you can see that. And every time I run it, whichever point is most to the left is going to be green. Great. Now I need to find the next point on the convex hull. And remember, I want to animate. So really, if I were to just go to uh, the back to the Wikipedia page, 
and look at the pseudocode. Let me take this down. So I see my nose does the itchy thing as soon as I start getting nervous about what I'm doing. If I were to go back to the Wikipedia page and just look at the pseudocode, you're going to see everything happens in just a set of nested loops. I don't want any loops to happen because I want every time through draw, I want to, the draw, P5 draw loop, I want to draw the next stage. So what I need to find, what I need is So I'm going to need another array, which will be the points that I'm placing along the hull. Uh, I want to say a left can be kind of, I think left can actually be, I think I want the original, left, like the leftmost. I'll call this leftmost. And then I'm going to call this current hull, uh, current vertex. Like that's the current vertex that I'm on, checking with. Um, and then I want to say let, and then current uh, point. So vertex, I'm going to use that term when it's a, specifically a vertex along the hull, and point is the current point that I'm checking to see if it's the next vertex. So maybe I also need a next vertex. So I think these are what I need. And I'm, so leftmost is just going to be this, uh, sorry, is this. And that's also the current vertex is going to start at the, as the leftmost. And then actually the current point is really an index. So let me call that index. And this is next vertex. And index is going to start at 0. And this is leftmost. And yes, let me make the leftmost point also a little bit bigger. Oh, I already made. <laughs> Let me make the leftmost point a little bigger. Okay. And let's also do um, current vertex as blue. So we don't see the green one anymore because the current vertex, and I should make these brighter. Let's just do that. The current vertex is now being drawn over the leftmost vertex. Okay. What's the next step? Oh, I'm going to need two indices. All right. So I'm going to make a guess that the next vertex is just points index 1. Okay? I'm going to make a guess when I'm starting that the next vertex is whatever happens to be the next point in the array. It's probably, it could be by coincidence, but it's probably not going to be. Then I need a, I'm confused here. I'm really thinking about this. You only have to check the points that you haven't reached so far. Yes, I'm aware of that. So I could just, but I do need that first point still. I do need to like sort of always include the leftmost point. So I'm going to keep that in there. Let me, all, let me all take it out. Yeah. <clears throat> and then actually the one that I want to check is then at 2. So the leftmost point is 0. The one that I'm guessing is going to be the next point is at 1. And then i got to start comparing everything at 2. So let's draw, just for the sake of argument here, 
I want to draw a line from current vertex to next vertex. <laughs> and let's say stroke 255, stroke weight 2. So we can say, look at that. Oh no, because they're sorted. So a lot of, I'm actually going to get lucky a lot of the time because they're sorted. <laughs> but you can see in this case, that's not, it's really got to pick probably this one or that one. So that's where it's starting. Now what I need to do is I also want to draw a line with the one that I'm checking. So I'm going to say checking is uh, points index, points index. Then I also want to draw a line to the one that I'm checking. So we can see those are the two that I'm comparing. So these are the two that I'm comparing and let's make this stroke so this one's going to be like green, and the one that I'm checking will just be white. Okay, so this is what's happening right now. I need to compare these two. I need to figure out which one is to the left. And by to the left, I mean basically like counterclockwise rotation. And guess what? There's a really nice way that I can do that. And the way that I can do that is with the cross product. Um, all right. The cross product is a particular vector operation that you can apply on a 2D vector, uh, two vectors that are in the same plane, and it will return to you a vector pointing perpendicularly in the third dimension away. And so what's interesting about this is, um, let, me, let, me, let me show you what I mean, and I can never remember which is which, but it doesn't really matter because we just need to know that it's one or the other. If this is vector A and this is vector B, the cross product of these two vectors will give me a vector pointing out this way. This would be in a, like a left-handed system, I guess, because that's my left hand. No, 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 that's left-handed would point the other way. Right-handed, I'm pointing out. I think that's how you do it. The point is, it's pointing out. But if I were to say, this one is B, so I'm doing A cross B, and this one is A, then I'm gonna get the cross product pointing in the other way. So I just need to test, is Z, the z value of a cross product b, is it greater than zero or less than zero? If, by the way, they were collinear or along the same path, you'll get zero. And we're just gonna assume for this case that when I'm picking random points, none of them are gonna be collinear. They'll probably sort of work out anyway. But so if it, b is to the left of a, if z is less than zero, it's to the right of a, if z is greater than zero, or the other way around, but I'll just test it, and it's flipped anyway in a computer graphics system, so it'll work itself out. Let's go try that. So if I go back to the code, what I need to do is I need to create those vectors. So I'm going to say uh, a is p5 vector subtract, and I want to subtract now what? The current vertex, no, next vertex, um, minus current vertex, that's one of the vectors, and then b is subtract checking minus the current vertex. Then the cross product, which I will just call cross, is a cross b. I could implement this myself, but thankfully it's, it, oh, I'm not in the, thank you everybody, ah! Oh, I'm not doing a screen recording either. I will have to do that again. Sorry, everyone. Right hand rule. <laughs> I'm going to get flamed in the comments for my miss. Uh... So let's write, write the code for that. So what I need is I need those two vectors. So A is a vector that points, so I can use the subtraction function because I can point from the next vertex what is currently the next vertex to the current vertex, that'll be vector A. 
and then B will be uh, pointing from the, uh, uh, what I'm checking to the current vertex, right? And then, uh, then on the cross product is A dot cross B. So I can implement the math for the cross product, but it's actually just there in the P5 library for me. And then I just want to say if cross is greater than zero, then probably something like next vertex. So let me not do anything right now. Let's just see. Let's, let's just console log the cross product and say no loop. So let's see. We got, oh, oh, cross.z, the z component. So we got a negative, oh, come on. Give me a bad, give me more obvious. All right. So we got a negative number. So the one that I'm checking is white. The one that it currently thinks is green. So is that right? Current one is green. So if it's less than zero, then that's to the left. So if cross.z is less than um, zero, then next vertex should actually be the one that I'm checking. And then I just want to say index equals index plus one. There we go. Now, of course, so you can see that as it goes through, it's always going to find the correct one. It's checking them all. Let's, let's make a lot of points so it takes longer. Ooh, that was weird. Why did that mess up? It found it like instantly, but it's checking them all. I just, yeah, it's going to find it pretty close because they're sorted. Um, but I think it's doing it correctly now. Something that I want to add that I think will just make this a little visually easier to follow is let me make a little uh, variable called buffer. And I'm going to say uh, pick a point between buffer, whoops, buffer, sorry, buffer and width minus buffer and the height also between buffer, buffer, and height minus buffer. And let's make that buffer even bigger. So now the points won't get picked super close to the edge. So why is it getting, is it not making it through everything? Oh, it's making it through all 100. All right. People are giving you some interesting uh, comments. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now I need an exit condition. So if index equals points, ah, oh, shoot. So now I definitely need a, an exit condition. So I could say if index equals points.length, I've gotten to the end of the array, and I, could, I should reset index back to what? This is the question. Uh, oh, I should put it in the hull. Let me, let me go back to do that again. So um, do, does this need to move like a little bit over? Am I standing in front of the code? I don't think that I am, but let me just give myself a little bit more. So clearly I need an exit condition. So I'm going to say if index equals points.length, that means I've gotten to the end of the array. Let me at least say no loop here. So I'm going to like just stop it from animating once it gets to the end. And <laughs> let me just go back to like uh, many fewer points. Just go back to 20. We'll do that pretty quickly. Um, and so what should happen is hull should get the next vertex. 
Did I put the, the current vertex uh, into, uh, so hull should also get, hull should get the current vertex. So now there are two points in the hull. Uh, the current vertex should equal next vertex. And then I need to reset index back to something. So let's also now add something where I draw the hull. So I'm going to say um, begin shape, uh, stroke, let's have the hull be blue. Uh, uh, begin shape, I'm going to draw a hull, um, let P of hull, and I'm going to draw um, all the hull points and shape. Um, and I'm not going to say close, but I am going to give it a really light fill. So I'm going to say fill. I also have it be blue, but with like a lot of alpha. So am I seeing it? I think as I said, no loop. Let me put all the drop mile. I'll move this out for a second. Oh, because it's only two points and it's after. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so I'm not actually seeing the hole yet because only two points are in there and I'm drawing it before I'm drawing the green line and the white line. So I could at least say like stroke weight four here and then I think I, no. Why am I not seeing? I think it's actually not even looping around. I'm not going to worry about that. Okay. So I'm not actually seeing the hole yet because I'm drawing it before I draw these other lines and I've stopped the looping from looping. But the real question is here is I need to then go and check for the next point. So I need to figure out what to reset index to. Mm. Oh, I also, that's, I didn't have that there. I don't know why. <laughs> then I need to, then I need to add vertex. And I, I don't think I'm going to see the hole yet because I've only drawn <laughs> two points so far and I've stopped the loop from looping. So let's, let's see what happens. What if I just reset index back to zero? and turn off no loop. Okay, <laughs> it got stuck. So I don't want to, oh, first of all, it's two equals. It should be equals. Oh, interesting. So look at that. It's doing something, but there's a problem. So resetting, it's like it keeps checking, but it keeps finding the same part of the convex hull over and over and over again. So I can't reset index back equal to zero because ultimately I don't want to check these two points again. I do actually want to leave this first one because that's going to be my end condition. But let's not worry about that right now. Let's actually do something where we remove the vertices from the points array when I put them in the convex hull just to see what happens. Um, but, um, so hold on. So array JavaScript. Is there a remove? I know I can splice. But can I just give it an object and it takes it out? Splice just uses index values. Or I could say I could just skip it if, it, if it's included. Or, oh, I know what I could do. Oh, 
I know what I could do. I could start at, I, if I don't want to remove it, I could start at the, the object, the, the, um, the vertex after the one that I just added. I just want to actually ignore the last one I put in. I don't need to ignore them all. I just want to ignore the last one. I mean, I can ignore them all, but I want that first one to be included. Yeah, make a check or a, yeah, okay. So we can see this is just finding the same vertex over and over again because it's actually checking against itself. And whatever cross product vector I guess out of itself is probably going to give me zero back or something. So it's always going to... Okay, okay, okay. I know what I'm doing here. I know. Index equals... And it's not if index equals points dot length. Okay. Uh, I don't want to check the same vertex yet. I mean, I could just eliminate checking the current vertex. Why don't I just do that? Let's just try that. That'll be simpler. So you can see it's kind of picking the same part of the hole over and over again because it's allowed, when I set index back to zero, it itself is one of the points it's going to check. So I think I could probably do something here that just say as long as checking is not equal to the current vertex, and then I can put this all around this, um, this should fix that. Oh no, it's still stuck. Yeah, I know I can ignore all of them. I don't want to because I want to. Oh, but then I can just check if, no, I won't check the, oh, that didn't work. Wait, why is that not working? Oh, 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 oh. Next vertex, oh, what next vertex needs to be something, not what it currently is. Ah, that's why. Okay, hold on. Next vertex needs to be set back to something else. It could actually just be the leftmost. I know, for some reason I'm stuck on, everyone's telling me to just take the point out of the list. <laughs> but I kind of don't want to because um, I want to keep the, I want to keep all the points in the list because then I want to have, I could make a set, I don't know why I'm stuck on that. I should just take the point out of the list. All right. And because then, then I have to store its index and splice it. All right, I'll do that though. Maybe I should just admit that I have to do that. All right. So you can see that even though it's doing this over and over again, it is stuck. <laughs> okay. So you, even though you see that it's doing it over and over again, it's stuck just picking the same vertex over and over again because that one is one of the ones I'm checking. So what, one way I could approach this is remove that one. So uh, the easiest way to do that would be with splice. So I also would want to pick the, um, 
I'm going to say next in the next vertex. I also should keep track of that next index. Let me just set that equal to negative one as an initial value. And then when I find it, I want next index to be that index value. And then I can say um, points dot splice uh, next index and just take that one value out. Now I'm still stuck. So the reason why I'm still stuck is because next vertex that it's comparing everything to is still that same one that it got before. So what I should do is just reset next vertex to something else. Like I'll just put it back to be that leftmost one. There we go. So now you can see it's working. Now it's stuck when it gets to the end. But guess what? The reason why is as I, I know when I'm done, right? I am done if next, if it actually picks next vertex as the same as the leftmost. So when it finds that one, then I can say console log done, uh, no loop, and then otherwise do all of this other stuff that I'm doing. So let's see how this goes. Voila! So let's uh, make this more interesting by giving me 200 points. And we can kind of take a look at this going. Now it takes a while to check all 200. So this should probably get sped up. I'll, I'll speed this up for you. Where's my ukulele tuner? Is it in here somewhere? I haven't learned any new songs. It's definitely out of tune, but I have a tuner somewhere. I don't know where it is. Oh, here it is. Uh-oh, I think I'm gonna need a new battery for my tuner. <laughs> it's not coming on. So the reason why the, um, I'm getting a question, the last vector should connect, it, oh, I should add it. So I, I would just use the close. <laughs> so the last vector is not connecting. So what I should do is I should actually always push the next vertex in um, so that that first point is in there twice and then it'll connect. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, what did I just do? Wait, why did I just break it? How did I just break it? Oh, I didn't break it, it just takes forever. <laughs> Should I ruin that whole speeding up thing? <laughs> Let's do that again. Again, for... Yeah, I, I, I got confused for a second. So, all right. So, Matt, to that whole thing you can disregard. So, it's being asked for me, why is it not connecting there at the end? Well, I could actually make it connect by changing the way that I'm drawing it to um, close. So someone's asking, why is it not connecting there at the end? And actually, one of the reasons why it's not connecting is just the way that I'm drawing it. If I add close here to end shape, 
It will connect those last two. You can see that there. Now they're connected. But um, it's also like closing it as it's going. So maybe what I actually want to do is just change it to uh, always put the next vertex in so that that is, oh, and, but it's not, then I say no loop, it doesn't draw it again. Maybe I'll take out the no loop. Just curious. Yeah. Um, removing the data. I didn't actually remove the data, right? Or did I splice them out? I can't remember how I did it. Oh, I did splice. Um, so I should really like put this into a separate array and then add them back in, but whatever. Uh, I will mention that. That's, that's a very good point. Oops. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like trying to make a this work for Mathieu to be edit for it to be edited well. Yeah, you can see that the points are gone, which is kind of a problem. Um, and so In a way, it makes more sense for me to just leave them in there but skip checking them, like, like Simon was saying. Um, I'm trying to think of what I want to say. So one issue that's being pointed out to me from the chat, which is really true, is that it's kind of a problem that I'm doing this splice because I've kind of corrupted the original data set. Like I don't have that original set of all of the points. I have the convex hull, but I no longer have all the points. So there's a couple ways I could approach that. For example, I could just like keep all those points that I'm splicing out in a separate array and add them back in. But what might be a better solution is adding, um, is I actually already have this hull point, this hull, a hull, I already have the hull I already have the hull array. So let's try this a slightly different way. Instead of splicing it out, what I'm going to do, oh, that worked anyway. Why did that work? No, oh, I don't actually need to splice it. Oh, it's actually fine. That's weird. It's never going to get stuck. No, I don't actually need to do this place. Does anybody understand why that worked? Because in theory, it's going to check against itself if I don't take it out. Did I splice it somewhere else? It just to make it more efficient. I don't really care about efficiency. Um, This is going to take forever. Huh. I was assuming it was going to get stuck at some point, but I don't see it getting stuck. Huh. The problem was next vertex. Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. So, Mathieu, there's a huge 
huge, when you're looking at this layer, there's a huge amount of stuff that you can kind of ignore because I'm going to just go from, I'm going to just explain that again. So the chat actually is pointing out to me, and rightfully so, that this splicing out of the one that I saved is, is problematic because I've corrupted the data it, itself. Like I don't have that original array of points anymore, and the context that I might be doing this in, that might actually be important. So I could keep that in a separate array, I could add it back in, but actually it turns out, and I've just discovered this uh, through some debugging, that I don't even need to delete it. The problem was really the fact that next vertex was not reset back to the leftmost. So it's actually gonna work just fine. Um, every single time with split, without splicing that out, as long as I reset the next vertex back to like leftmost so that it sort of skips getting stuck. Um, so let's just make sure this, let's watch this happen now with like 200 points um, and I will speed this up for you. We can see that it's done and it looks correct. I'm pretty sure I did this correctly because it seems to be working. Of course, this is less efficient because I'm checking extra points that I don't need to check because they're already part of the convex whole array. So I could add something to check to skip those. And but but this isn't even the most efficient algorithm in the first place. I just want to get this idea to work. So um, you can see that it doesn't actually connect at the end because I didn't I don't have close. Um, as one of the uh, in end shape, so I could add that in. Let me just put that in for you. You'll see what this does differently. Speed this up again. Something is wrong with this ukulele tuner because I just put a new battery in. All right, so you can see what it's doing now. Uh, it is always closing the shape with whatever the latest vertex is. But really, while I have implemented this and gotten this working, I I have not picked nice colors or been really thoughtful about the stroke weight or how this takes a very long time to animate. So it's nice that I'm kind of animating every single possibility. But I think you could probably make something pretty interesting out of this by changing the way you draw it or thinking about how you might make this interactive or maybe the user can add points. Um, there's a lot of possibilities. But this will be a nice building block, a foundation to hopefully do more computational geometry coding challenges. In particular, eventually I want to build a triangulation 
around all these points and then figure out how to make a Delaunay triangulation, which has to do with a way of having all the triangles, the circle that fits any given triangle doesn't include any other points. It's known as a circumcircle. So I, I think I will come back and do a coding challenge just to do the circle that fits any given triangle. It's a pretty quick thing that I can show you. Um, but there's a lot more to come with this. Make your own version of this. Share it with me. Go to thecodingtrain.com to the page with this coding challenge. And there's, a, there's a instructions there of how to share your version of this. Uh, maybe you can make this tie this to sound or some, something else that I can't even possibly imagine now. Uh, I look forward to seeing what you make. And uh, oh, also you might want to investigate one of the other algorithms, in particular the gram scan algorithm. Maybe I'll come back and actually just do that as a video also. But if you, if you make a version of that, please submit that as well. Okay, thanks for watching. See you soon. Okay, um, I think this is done. There is a video to be made out of this. Um, I think it's almost more interesting with fewer points because of the way I'm animating everything. Um, all right, so everybody, please make a version that doesn't check the points in the blue area. Yeah, so all of the, I, ever, I, I appreciate what everyone's suggesting to me. There are so many added efficiencies to this algorithm, but I wanted to just literally do the basic gift wrapping one, which I think I have done. I will come back. You can actually, I'll publish the code for um, this one. This is the gram scan algorithm. You can see how much uh, faster it is, although I guess I'm probably not animating every piece of it maybe, but um, um, so I, I, I will come back and maybe do that or release this. So I think I'm done for today. Let me check. <laughs> I'm just curious. Where is my brilliant challenge? There are some things I just want to check. Uh, which is the one? Oh, I already did it. Which is larger? Uh, I want to get mine up at the top, people. Of course, mine's not necessarily the best. Oh, there it is. All right. I got helpful and interesting. And a comment. Thank you, the coder 5550 Nilsson. Yes, coding train for the win. Uh, all right. Um, okay, where was who? Somebody, somebody in the chat, me was Mateus, posted a link to a P5 sketch, but I don't know where that went. All right, I've really got to run. It's 2.15. Oh my goodness, this has been a very long live stream, over three hours. Uh, out of this will come a video, part of a new series of making a processing library. Um, also, this convex hull coding challenge will come out. Uh, and then, oh, the final module three video. Ah, thank you for asking this, Arif. So let me go back here. Uh, let me find the bookmark bar. The, how do I get it to show? So let me go here. So I, I've been neglecting. I, don't, I, I guess I'll release this on Monday. It's already there, though. <laughs> I'm sorry that I, I kind of got sidetracked. But um, this new playlist that I released called Working with Data and APIs in JavaScript. It's a full course that's kind of like a follow-up of my intro to coding. It's barely, it's not with P5, it's with Node and native JavaScript. It uses P5 in a couple videos. Um, there's a trailer for it here, um, and then a whole set of videos. They're all public. This playlist, I don't know why, this playlist is also unlisted. So you can actually find it. I think if you just go into this video. Hello, welcome. And go to the description. You could just go to the next lesson right here. They're all available. I just hadn't made them all. Public. Welcome to another so working with data and API find this video. I um, have one more thing just to there. Sorry to that that wasn't clear. Um, I find that if I really, I don't know that this is actually true, but my strategy with YouTube is even if I have like 10 videos ready to go, I don't release them all at once because then people's notifications just get the latest one. It's confusing to find them. So I kind of like act as if they're coming out one per day, but often if it's ready or even if it's being prepared to be ready, like I haven't put the English captions on yet or the thumbnail's not done, then uh, it's just set to unlisted, but you can usually find it in the playlist. Okay. Um, Something similar to gift wrapping in 3D using planes and two points. Yeah, probably. Um, all right, I've really got to go. Thank you so much. I, this has been fun. I hope that you enjoyed this live stream, that it was good. You got something out of it. All right. Uh, this is my gift to you. You will now have a green screen of me 
solving a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> of course, there's green on the Rubik's Cube, which is really going to mess you up. I'm hoping I can solve this before the music ends. That's my goal. One of these days I'll learn some actual speed cubing techniques. <laughs> this is basically a beginner's method. I didn't make to do the daisy, so let's skip that one step, I guess. Does that make it slightly more advanced? My son is turning 11, and I asked his grandparents to get him a new cube. It's like a expensive, fancy speed cube, three by three, so of course I'll just be using that. <laughs> oh, seriously? Ugh. Oh. Getting so unlucky. Oh. oh, what do I do with this configuration? This I can never figure out. I just do it until I get the thing that I want. Ah, oh, I got it! <laughs> oh, I messed it up. I think I had it further solved than I thought I did. There we go. Oh. Yes, I beat the song. So, I don't know, that was about three minutes if I, that was about three minutes. Okay. <laughs> Missed easy solve with 32 moves. <laughs> I still, the things that, things that are, are, are not so great about my technique is one, I, I can do it relative to a different side but it kind of messes with me, so I'm, I get messed up, and I'm not as, so, and I'm, so I'm not really examining for like which is the best side to start with, and I'm just, yeah. Uh, I also like, at the, some of the end stages, I only know a couple of the algorithms, like, I only know like the clockwise one, <laughs> so I just do the clockwise one multiple times, since I don't know the counterclockwise one. Same thing, just do it twice instead of once. That doesn't make it very efficient. Um, all right, so, um, other things. I, I know I have trouble leaving, but I really do have to go. Um, I can maybe try to take one or two questions. Um, I don't know that I'm, I'm probably actually not going to get to this today because I took so long doing this live stream. Um, but if you were, I will be uh, uh, doing a members only recording session, just a green screen recording session, as I mentioned. Um, to record some interstitial explanations for the neuroevolution car challenge. So stay tuned for that. Take a look at the community tab if you're a member or, uh, or if you're um, in, in, in the Slack channel as a patron, you can check that as well. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so more, I could, could, you could do more on sweep line algorithms. Okay, that would be great. So I will be back for, uh, in terms of schedule, I hope, I plan to do one live stream again next week. I haven't set a date for that yet. The best way to find out is either to um, 
subscribe as a member or a patron. <laughs> I like post my thoughts on that as I go in the Slack channel, but you don't need to. Um, you can just subscribe to the channel and click the alarm bell. I'm pretty sure it gives you a notification when I schedule it. And I usually try to do that at least 24 hours in advance. Um, so one day next week, uh, uh, I will be, it might actually just be Friday, the very last day of the week, but hopefully I'll do it sooner. I'll be doing one last live stream for the month of June. And it's TBD what's gonna happen for uh, July and August. Um, but I will be working on, it actually would be a good thing if I can't live stream for July and August. And I'll tell you why. This book really needs a new edition. It needs a, a new edition to uh, be ported over to JavaScript, and it needs new material about neural networks and neuroevolution. And I think I could actually accomplish that in July and August if I'm not live streaming and I could use that time that I would be to be just like working on the book. Because I've said this for like three years and I've basically gotten nowhere. So I am gonna work on this on Monday. Um, and this is what I will consider as a benefit to people who are members or patrons. I will send you early drafts and versions of the new book and hopefully the new book will come out. Um, it'll all be, always be available for free. It's just if you want the early versions um, I'm getting those out over the summer. All right, I know, but you can always just unsubscribe for me if I'm not producing enough content. That's fine with me too. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, by the way, so if it's unclear, you can just, uh, the book is available for free if you just slide these to zero. Of course, if you're able to support, that's great. And it's also, there's an um, HTML version of it, but it's pretty out of date and I need to uh, fix it up. Okay, people are asking about what I do outside of YouTube live streaming. So um, I will just mention this before I go. Um, I teach at a program, Ooh, why is the internet down? Did I lose the internet or is like the ITP website down? No. Who knows? Um, I teach at a program, there's two programs at Tisch. ITP is the graduate master's program. IMA is the undergrad program. This is a Tisch School of the Arts. So correct, I am definitely not a computer science professor. I don't even know what I am, but I do teach at a university, a very big uh, institution, New York University. Um, that's where I actually am right now. Um, and, and this whole program is moving to a new building in Brooklyn. And that's actually why I'm, uh, this space is going away and a new space is being set up where I can hopefully uh, have some new equipment and stuff. So stay tuned uh, and I will see you in the future. All right, goodbye everybody. I will play you out with the This Dot song. Actually, the Pearl and Noise song is good. Let's play that one first. So this is random, this is noise, Pearl and Noise that is. In the core random algorithm, the actual random algorithm itself, those numbers aren't related at all. You pick, like, I'm picking random numbers between zero and 10. Nine, two, seven, six, one, nine. Four, eight, nine, two, one, three. I pick nine a lot, apparently. But with Pearl and Noise, I might pick numbers like this. Two, three, four, three, four, five, six, five, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, seven, six. Boy, this is like Pearl and Noise performance art. Nine, two, seven, six, one, nine, four, eight, nine, two, nine, three. I pick nine a lot. Two, three, four, three, four, five, six, five, four. Oh, this five, is like Pearl and Noise performance art. Seven, five, nine, two, seven, six, one, nine, four, eight. But with Pearl and Noise, I might pick numbers like this. Two, three, four, three, four, five, six, five, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, five. Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. So this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. This is this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. So this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl, Pearl and noise. Pearl, Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. So this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. This is this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. So this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl, Pearl and noise. Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. This is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl and noise. So this is Pearl and noise, that is. Pearl, Pearl and noise. This is Pearl and noise, Apparently. But with pearly noise, I might pick numbers like this. Two, three, four, three, four, five, six, five, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, five, two, three, four, three, four, five, six, five, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, five. Well, this is like pearly noise performance art. 
As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. Song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. This dot. This dot, never forget this dot. I'm gonna do the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, the this dot song, never forget the this dot.